All righty. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Pauline White. And before I hand it over to the speakers today, I'd like to just take a moment to go through some logistics of our webinar. Um, first, we will be recording the session and sharing the on-demand replay for you to share with your colleagues. At the end of the session, we will have a Q&A. So feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A pod throughout the webinar. Please do not use the chat pod so we can compile the information in one central location. Upon entry to the call, everyone is muted. However, if you do have a question that is too complex for the Q&A pod, please feel free to raise your hand. I will unmute your line and you will be able to ask your question live. We certainly want to hear from you. So with that, I believe we are ready to get started. I am, will hand that over to Bill and Tim. Hey, thanks so much, Pauline. This is uh, Tim Solms. I run the government business over at Dun & Bradstreet, and uh, we're, we're really appreciative of you all coming in today. We know that we've got a lot going on with just finishing the government fiscal year, and, uh, and now we're really focused on um, some of the requirements that our customers are collectively putting in front of us. We thought this was timely for us to come in uh, and address uh, the, some of the interim guidance that we've received. Um, here with our partner from Complex, Bill. Hey, thanks, Tim. Yeah, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to the webinar today. Um, this is uh, um, not our first uh, webinar uh, on the CMMC topic, but I think this one comes uh, at a good time. As Tim just said, you know, the, uh, the federal fiscal year just ended. And so this is a time when a lot of people who, um, who work in that space uh, take a little pause, do some strategic planning. Um, examine you know what they've got going because the crush of the closing year-end business uh, uh, just ended um, but also um, uh, on the news uh, agenda um, the, the government uh, just released um, the interim rule as a, applies to the DFARS so it's a great conversation um, topic to discuss what it means um, how it might impact CMMC because we're going to talk about CMMC uh, today obviously and, um, and I just wanted to say, um, you know, we're, we're pleased uh, to be working um, with um, Dun & Bradstreet. Um, I run the government business over at Complex Government Solutions. I'm the president and GM of Complex Government Solutions. Um, and when we, were, when we looked at this um, issue of finding the right partner on something like um, CMMC, um, we're a, you know, we're a data analytics company, but we, when we look at Dun & Bradstreet, they're kind of the gold standard for supply chain information as it relates to the defense industrial base. We've all heard of the Dun's number. I mean, it, it was an obvious choice. And, um, and so we're very pleased to be partnered with Dun & Bradstreet on this CMMC solution. Yeah, you know, thanks, Bill. And, it, you know, it's interesting. Yes, uh, you'll, you'll see a similar family name between the two of us and maybe some, and maybe some other, uh, resemblance. Um, you know, Bill and I have done, you know, most of our careers uh, in, in similar fields. We were both Apache pilots in the Army for careers, though he, uh, he was way ahead of me on that exactly. one, and we both wound up in the, on the technology side. Um, but what I'll say is a, a little over a year ago, we were looking at this uh, at CMMC as the conversation was really beginning, and, and our goal was to make some really some data-informed decisions, right? Because those tend to be um, much less, uh, you know, it's much easier to focus when we're looking at the, at the, at the data and the information that data provides. Um, Bill reached out and gave me a call and said, hey, look, you know, we're looking at this thing very closely. And, uh, the, you know, the light really came on for us. Yep, our data, is, our data is really good. It's very relevant. It helps inform the decisions. Um, but we looked at Complex and said, hey, from a partner perspective, you know, they're, they're not only best in class when it comes to the security and the security analytics that are out there that, that we can apply to the data, but more importantly, as we were looking at trying to take a disruptive approach to this thing, you know, we, we've, all, we've, we've been in the government uh, business for a long time. I think, I, Bill, I think I added up yesterday, I think together over 77 years of government experience between us. Uh, awesome. that's more, yeah, that's more than a little bit. Um, you know, but one of the things one of the things that we saw when we look at this is, you know, we've we've all had to tackle these regulatory obstacles as they've come our way. None of us look at 
improving our security as it, as it pertains to our ability to support the defense industrial base, you know, um, uh, it, it, we see it as a, as a good thing. But what, what's, what is a cost-effective, smart, you know, agile way to approach this thing so that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't throw a huge barrier to entry to this market? Um, and that's where the partnership made a lot of sense. And we've, um, we've done quite a bit of work uh, as we pull this thing together. I will say I'm extremely pleased with the simplicity, um, you know, with the, the ease of use, and, and honestly, with the cost of what the solution looks like. It was something... Uh, that you know, we think that we can bring to the entire market relatively easily. Yep, I I agree. I know we've got a number of uh, I know we've got a number of questions that we want to talk about today, discuss uh, where we are, and I think uh, some more very important points uh, that we'd like to bring up about the regulation and our and our uh, pre-assessment solution. You know, will come up as we discuss those points. Yeah. So the interim rule, um, you know, I, I've, I've gone over and I've read through it like all of you have, uh, you know, it's, it, it, I, I, you know, I think that it, it caught us off, off guard just a little bit. When I say that, meaning the, the fact that we got an interim rule, uh, we have a 60 day window to comment. And then it, the, it appears as if at the end of that 60 days, we go right into, you know, the regulatory compliance piece. Is that the way, Bill, is that how you all are reading it as well? Well, you know, that's probably one question I would really like to ask because I, you can read it that way. It also says um, you, got, you have to submit written uh, uh, comments by November 30th if you want them to be included in the final rule. Well, uh, so that implies that they're going to have to consider comments that come in on November 30th. So, I, you know, um, I can't speak for the government. Uh, and I know you and I both agree on that. Um, so uh, uh, it's I'm uh, I'm a little uncertain as to whether they're going to implement the final rule on December 1st or whether they're going to do it sometime shortly thereafter. What is clear is they're going to implement it. Uh, they're going to implement it fairly soon. Um, and there are a couple of questions as to how it relates to CMMC that I think we want to talk about today. Um, and, and I know we're going to get to. Um, but uh, but that's one that we're digging for information on as to when it's going to be implemented. And we have something that I'm going to address later uh, that uh, that essentially um, will help our customers deal with that, uh, whether or not they implemented it on December 1st or, or, or later on. And, and uh, we'll get a chance to talk about that before this. Well, I, I am going to pick you with one question. So we have that 60 day window um, and it began uh, end of last month. Um, the window for the comments. Right, for, for, yeah, for the comments. I, I look at it though, for, for all of us in the industry, I think we have, a, we have you know, sort of a, an obligation, you know, as, as, as well as a responsibility to make sure that we do engage with that. Like you just said, the question about when that goes in, into effect. I didn't know if you had any uh, thoughts or any encouragement to the other folks in the industry about how to take advantage of this window that we're in. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think uh, uh, people should be asking comments, and I, uh, I'm sure they're going to get a lot of comments because uh, some things are clear and some things are a little less clear. I'm sure the people who issued the interim rule know what they intend to do. Uh, we just want to make sure that it's clear to industry. I mean, the whole reason that we're doing this pre-assessment for CMNC is to help industry um, make it, um, you know, easier and faster and cheaper to get ready to comply with these new requirements. I, I, I don't think anybody can question that there have been some lapses in cybersecurity that have let some of our national treasure uh, spill out uh, into, uh, into other places. And, um, uh, and that it's, um, you know, it's a, I, I think the, um, the DOD is very rightly addressing this question with some tougher standards. Um, the interesting one about this interim rule is um, compliance with NIST 800-171 is not new, right? People have been, that's been a, uh, that's been a clause in the FARS for uh, contracts uh, for a while now. What, what is new is the means in which they're going to um, uh, document that. You know, you have the low, medium, and high. Um, you know, low is uh, for uh, 800-171 is still going to be a self-attested uh, self-attestation 
Um, it's going to be entered in the uh, SPRS, the Supplier Performance Risk System. I had to write that down to make sure I didn't uh, mangle uh, the acronym. Um, and uh, so, uh, and that's and uh, you know that's going to be related, you know, to um, you know to the contracts uh, that they're responding to. Um, so, um, uh, companies should should just find that if in fact they were really doing what was in 800171 they should not have a heavy lift to be able to document that they've complied with NIST 800171 um, one of the reasons that this is coming about and one of the and one of the reasons that um, OSD mentioned that they were driving towards the CMMC um, certification um, is that they were discovering uh, post facto when a breach occurred um, that uh, maybe companies weren't as compliant with NIST 800 171 as they thought they were. Um, so Tim, the last comment that I, I'm going to make about this is that there was some confusion that I heard about people wondering, was the interim rule somehow overlapping and was it going to, was it signaling that maybe the government wasn't as serious about CMMC? Were they going to be changing course? And if you read the interim rule itself, it clearly states that the government is going to be doing both. They have some different timelines. They have some different methods. Uh, they have they do slightly different things. There is some overlap, right? Yeah. And that CMMC was was built very heavily on uh, the NIST 80171 standards, um, but they are different. And the government is talking about doing them both. So, um, so the defense industrial base needs to get ready for both. Well, and it's interesting when you say defense industrial base, because if we do look at, at, the, at the NIST standards, one of the things that we've seen very quickly is uh, how that goes beyond to not only uh, the rest of the federal market, but really to the public sector market, right? And um, so as all, all of us are sitting here going, okay, there's going to be some associated costs with this readiness. And I don't think any of us read the government uh, estimates of those costs, you know, um, with a, any any sense of confidence in those numbers. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'd say that I've, I have said to Katie Aronson, and, and we'll stand by that. Um, what I will say is that when you look at those costs and say, okay, if those costs apply just beyond our defense business, but at our public sector business, and not only that, but our public sector business, even conservatively across the five eyes, it becomes a little bit more um, compelling uh, any of the investments that that have to go into this. And look, when we when, again, when we when we try to come at this thing, and when Bill and I first sat down and started sort of nugging this out, we said, look, this cannot be this cannot be a consulting uh, opportunity. This has to be a very cost effective, very easy to use solution that that really brings the you know the power and the simplicity of complex. And the power of the data and the simplicity of, of, of merging those together into a tool. We would encourage you all um, to, to, to interrupt us, to ask questions, to challenge us on some of this, on how we're bringing this to market. And also, if we just want to have some general discussion about these, uh, about, about associated costs or barriers to entry in the marketplace. Yeah, hey, thanks, Tim. Uh, so as Tim mentioned, uh, it's exactly what we want to do. So the first thing we want to do, just to get an idea of the audience and kind of where they're positioned around CMMC. So we've got a few. The, our obligation for us to engage in that commentary period is high. We have to do it. You have to read this. And, and even, if, even if the question seems relatively benign, bring that. Bring that. Uh, that's a but the, but that's a government question to answer. It really is about about when that's going to go into effect. Um, I, I've read it and it reads as if on the 61st day it does. Uh, at the same time, you have to go. Okay, then why have a comment period at all if that can't if that can't be factored in? And we know is that industry when we you know when we're when we come together uh, on these issues, you know the voice and the impact is pretty powerful. And I, I want to do. We all want to make sure that. Um, there's a responsible use of the feedback that, that we provide during this window. Okay. All right. Great. Um, you know, another question we've had, uh, and I know we're going to talk about kind of the levels a little more in depth here, uh, but uh, Joseph was at, Joseph was asking, uh, Bill, this is for you. Sorry. Uh, once a company gets certified, say level three, how often is 
you know, how often will they need to get reassessed or, or go through the process? Yeah, and, and I, I see that question. And just to point out, he's asking specifically about NIST 800 from the interim rule, um, just, to, just to clarify. Um, but the answer is the same as CMMC, because having read through the interim rule, they're making it clear uh, that your, um, your certification uh, for um, uh, 800-171 will last for three years, which is the same uh, as for CMMC. It'll be listed in SPRS and, um, and that um, uh, contracting officers will refer to SPRS to make sure you still have a valid um, NIST 800-171 and CMMC uh, uh, Eight hundred one seventy one uh, attestation and CMMC certification that are current uh, before they award a, a contract. And just as a reminder, um, uh, I mentioned it earlier. SPRS stands for the Supplier Performance Risk System. I had to check my notes again just to make sure I didn't mangle it. Um, but that is a government system um, where they're going to list the company's eight hundred one seventy one attestation compliance whether it's low, medium, or high, and they're also going to list the CMMC certification uh, compliance. Okay. Um, you know, I know there's another question we get, Bill, a lot is, is one of the first contracts for requiring CMMC going to come out? What's the latest we've, we've got on that? So um, all I can do here is uh, repeat what I've heard the government say, right? Because this is not, you know, my opinion on this uh, it doesn't matter. What matters is what the government's going to do. And so I've heard Katie Arrington say herself uh, several times, and I've seen it in publications. The, the first 10 RFPs, which they're referring to as the Pathfinder RMP, RFPs for CMMC, uh, are coming out uh, in November, so before the end of November. Um, and then they're going to ramp up um, uh, with uh, an increased number of, um, of uh, RFPs where the CMMC level will be stated clearly that you must have in order to be awarded the contract, not to bid on the contract, but you must be certified. You must have completed your audit and been certified at the level before you can be awarded the contract. So we'll be watching as much as everybody else, I think, to see, uh, okay, where are they? Um, and uh, and uh, how has, uh, how has um, DOD chosen um, to, to roll it out? Which ones did they pick? and that in fact the game is really on okay great great uh tim uh, there's a question here about the controls for nist 800 171 seem to uh be not really prescriptive unlike pci do you feel many people will likely self-certify only to potentially fail when audited by a third party well you know you know candidly i think this is where we got into some of the requirements for CMMC. and if you look they, they sort of look different they look at different things so you know, one is, hey, we have to look at our IT security system. The other is our supply chain to include the supply chain into those IT security systems. Um, Self-certification will apply for a certain factor. Remember, if you, you could contract with the Department of Defense to mow grass or, you know, fill, you know, gumball machines in the Pentagon, you're still on a DOD contract to do that. Um, what, what, you know, what, what I will tell you is I think the the window, we've all had several years where we could, you know, do that self-attestation. And I think what the government saw is that there were different levels of adherence to those requirements. So the bar is being raised once you get to be on basic. Um, to, and, and I think what you'll see is that there will be a lot of collateral benefit between going through that process for the NIST standard and going through that process for the CMMC um, certification. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll tell you right now that you know, as, as we sat down you know, between Dun and Bradstreet and Complex and, and we're looking at this, we really, we really did it from the informed uh, NIST perspective as we went into build this. So um, there is uh, a lot of, um, there's a lot of benefit to both of those requirements in the, in the, in the uh, solution that we're able to deliver. Hey, Tim um, and uh, Brian, just one thing I want to add to that, you know, the, the, when the question talked about, you know, is there a risk of, you know, hey, we've been self-attesting uh, to this and uh, suddenly we're going to get audited by a third party, whether it's CMMC 
or an 800-171, if you get a medium or a high, that's the government is going to come in and check you. And that's the whole point of doing a pre-assessment, right? That's the whole point of wanting to do a check internally to make sure you're ready and you're not going to have that risk of, hey, I've been self-attesting and thinking I'm okay and am I going to get sudden bad news that's going to shut me down from being awarded government contracts and impacting you know, my business. So um, we're going to talk uh, a little bit later about um, our product roadmap and how we're going to help you address the, this uh, 800-171 uh, uh, certification that you've got to upload in SPRS um, because we're expanding the things that we're doing with this product to help address both. Um, and um, but by doing an, uh, by doing a pre-assessment, uh, you're lowering the risk that you're going to get a bad surprise. And that's what, that's the message I'm trying to send to the defense industrial base. Um, as Tim pointed out before, we didn't want this to turn into a big consulting contract. Yeah. We wanted something simple, something, uh, you know, technology based, something data based, um, and, um, and, uh, something that would help, uh, make it help the, the, the companies that are trying to, to do business with the DOD, get it done. Uh, faster, easier, understand the requirements better, you know, and, and meet the intent of what these uh, security requirements are for. Okay. Great. Thanks, Bill. Hey, Brian, um, hold on. I mean, I add something to that. So, you know, um, when, you, when you look, you know, all, all of us that have been doing this government business, whether you're a defense person or whether you're a broader public sector person, this, we, we, we tell the same story within our, our commercial companies, right? High barriers to entry, Long, longer contract cycles, um, you know, and very different ways to be able to influence the outcome than you can in the commercial world, right? We, we know those things. While these are additional barriers to entry into the market, none of us would argue the relevance of them. Um, so to jump on what Bill said, what we looked at, you know, we looked at this thing and, you know, both of us running these government businesses, we were looking at saying, how, how are we going to do this without you know, this bringing us to our knees just so we can bid on the next defense contract or better yet, keep the contracts that we currently have. And that was really the motivation being, you know, behind, uh, you know, data driven decisions, you know, informed by really solid cybersecurity analytics on top of that. And, and, and I think that's what we got to, uh, but you all as the users out there will be, be the ones to, um, you know, to give us that feedback. Okay, great. Uh, hey, Bill, another question here, and this is kind of going to be a, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. So Mike Arnold's asking, you know, what's the timeline to be, become certified with a specific CMMC level? And, and his question is really not about the, the, you know, picking a different level, but it's also his company, it sounds like probably doesn't understand or haven't, hasn't decided which level they're going to go for. Um, and, and I think that's a conversation they have to have and, and curious for both of your thoughts on that. Um, and then you know, coupled with that, um, you know, we talk to them, talk to, you know, what do they consider when they're picking the levels? Is that based on the contracts? Is it based on what they want to do? Well, okay. I, I, so first of all, I don't think this is a question that I'm going to be able to help them with. Okay. Uh, or DNB either. Um, this is a, you know, uh, you know, what levels should they get certified at? They need to review their own business. They need to review their pipeline. Um, uh, they need to uh, review each of the security controls that are that are um, that are in uh, level one through five. Okay, they need to look at the general description. Uh, CMMC level one is essentially just basic hygiene, right? And every um, and this is something that we didn't specifically point out earlier. There is that exception. Um, uh, CMMC won't be required for pure COTS products. Okay. Um, and, um, but uh, if it's not a pure COTS product, um, every company is going to have to be at least CMMC level one. Okay. Um, and uh, level two, they call a transition. Um, if you're actually uh, dealing with uh, creating, storing, doing anything with um, CUI, you know, controlled and classified information, um, what uh, KD has mentioned and, um, and OSD has made clear that CMMC level three or higher is going to be required. And um, 
really, um, you know, folks need to look into what the control questions are for CMMC level three, four, and five um, in their assessment of where they're going to need to land. Folks who are dealing with highly sensitive um, uh, capabilities uh, that they're uh, providing uh, to the Department of Defense um, probably have a good idea uh, if they're if they're um, uh, going to be uh, uh, required to certify uh, at a level four or five. Um, it's really not our job um, as part of doing this, helping them with this pre-assessment to tell them which CMMC level they need to certify at, but we can tell them if they go through the pre-assessment for the different levels, which ones they are well positioned to, um, uh, to be certified for now. And, and that's one of the advantages in the way in which we're providing um, this solution uh, to the customers, right? You're getting a one-year subscription to the CMMC pre-assessment solution. Um, uh, that that subscription applies to you know your legal entity that signed up for it, right? So so if you're a big company and you have a dozen subsidiaries, um, no, those are different legal entities, uh, right? So you you can't take one subscription and pass it around. Uh, a large system integrator and all their subsidiaries. But your legal entity can run that solution um, to include the, the open source uh, cyber scan looking for vulnerabilities um, as many times as you want in that one year. Okay, that's the way it's, that's the way it's set up uh, to be licensed. Um, you can also do it uh, for multiple different levels, right? Uh, hey, I'd like to shoot for a CMMC level five because that way I'll never have to worry um, uh, and then when you look at it and you go through the pre-assessment, uh, you realize that maybe we're not ready to be certified at a level five. Um, or, uh, hey, I'm a company that does a lot of business with the Department of Defense. And this batch of contracts are going to be our needs CMMC level three. And this batch of contracts are going to need CMMC level four. Um, and so I want to run it multiple times um, because um, while a CMMC um, uh, uh, certification can apply to your company as a whole, depending on how you're organized. It also specifically calls out um, uh, in the interim rule, which added some clarity on CMMC as well, that you can, um, you can segment your enterprise uh, and get a, uh, for instance, you might get a CMMC level five on a particularly um, uh, sensitive um, area that certain levels of your contracts are gonna be uh, run through. But if there's a logical and um, physical separation with other elements of your company, you might be able to get a CMMC level three over here and a level five over there. So we encourage any, any company that has questions about uh, CMMC and uh, if they're gonna be able to certify to take the pre-assessment, go through each of the questions, in there, we call out each of the security control questions. Then we explain it in simpler language. Then we give you an example or two of what a good answer looks like for uh, when the government auditor looks at you. What are the key things that are gonna be looking for? Um, what are things that you're gonna have to answer um, completely? Um, so um, so I, I get back to my same point. The best place to start your uh, process is to take the pre-assessment, see where your company stands, put your plan together from there, and you'll know uh, how to focus your efforts from that point. Okay, great, thanks, Bill. Uh, somebody had asked if we're gonna have uh, the webinar be downloadable, we will be sending out a link so people can watch the, the webinar uh, and replay it and share that link as well. So that'll happen. Uh, Tim, for you, a couple quick questions here. Um, you know, from my understanding, it says can, you can only self-attest for a level one, all others must be by a third party. Um, I'll do it for the others, yeah. So again, you're, you're asking me a government question. I'll, I'm, I'm going to give you my opinion based on what I've, uh, my interaction uh, with OSD, you know, uh, and watching this very closely. Um, on, on the NIST side, uh, for basic self attestation uh, still, uh, still is in play, and it's for basic contracts. The question then becomes the contracts that you currently have and the future contracts, at what level will they be, will, will those procurements be solicited? That we don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and the same thing within CMMC is that, uh, you know, when we're looking at the lowest level, 
um, you know, you still have to go through the process of the evaluation and the certification. Um, what we have makes that much easier because, you know, as Bill said, kind of walks you through step by step, you're gathering the information, you're validating the information against, you know, against a, a, a tremendous um, pool of knowledge and, and, um, and, and, and examples and then being able, to, being able to present that as necessary. Uh, you know, and also, it, you know, the higher levels are going to are going to require uh, certification, and those, again, part of preparing for that certification is handing over your, you know, your uh, your documentation and and sort of your checklist to facilitate that process, right? Hey, Tim, uh, let me. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, no, please. Uh, I just wanted to chime in a little bit there. So he, he's crossing the streams a little bit on that question. Uh, so for the the NIST 800-171 um, uh, um, assessments that are required in the interim rule, uh, they're, they're, they have a low, medium, and high that, to refer to um, the 800-171, not, not level one. So, um, and they, they specify that the low is still a self-attestation, right. but that medium or high will be a government-led um, uh, review, okay? So for so NIST 871, that's low, medium, and high per the interim rule. CMMC is level one through five. Right. All of those will not be self-attestation. All of CMMC, level one through five, must be done by a government auditor. Obviously, level one's much easier than a level five, a much fewer uh, control questions. And all of those security control questions are available. Uh, they're in the public domain. It's not something that'll be a surprise question. You can look at them now. And certainly, uh, if you run through our pre-assessment, we're gonna show you exactly what those security control questions are, are gonna be. That's you know, one of the good reasons you would do this, besides showing you what they are, explaining what they mean uh, in a little simpler language if you don't have a sophisticated compliance team, um, and then giving you um, uh, uh, an example of what we think a strong answer uh, will be that will satisfy the government auditor. You know, a lot of questions that are coming in uh, are interesting around the sources of this information. And, uh, you know, what I, what I will, you know, sort of answer broadly for those is the government needs to continue to be the source. You know, there are some, there are some other, you know, uh, bodies that have been put together made up of, uh, you know, members of the, of the private sector. Um, you know, there are certainly, there's no lack of articles or insight out there. Uh, what I, what I would continue to say, whether you're looking for list of three, you know, three PAOs, or whether you're looking for uh, the standard or the requirements, uh, is let the government be the source of data. There, uh, we'll put the we'll put you know sort of the the that OSD website up up in this so that you have that and you can get to it. Um, but go go to the source. Uh, for these this information, so that you're not getting um, confused uh, by you know what I would call the, the the folks that may be motivated to get into long-term consulting contracts. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, Bill, you had you had mentioned earlier about talking a little bit about the roadmap. Do you want to let's let's jump to that real quick, and you want to talk about kind of uh, the capabilities. Um, and then when you're done, what we're going to do while you're doing that is we're going to go ahead and put up a poll, just giving some feedback on the webinar, making sure we get the feedback from you, the attendees. Is this the right content? Is this helpful for you? Uh, that just helps us make these better for you. So, uh, Bill, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and thank you, Pauline. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to mention because, uh, as Tim stated earlier, um, uh, we found out about the interim rule the same time you guys did. Um, you know, I was a little surprised, uh, you know, we had to do, uh, we had to read up on it real quick, make sure we understood it. Um, and, uh, and as Tim said a, a couple times, uh, we're not, we're not the government. We don't speak for the government. Um, um, so, um, one of the things we realized when we looked at it, um, is that, um, that companies would now be wondering whether their previous self attestations in this 800-171 um, had been good enough, and was it likely to um, to uh, pass review uh, with the government? Now that they're um, uh, reviewing that, and you have to post it in SPRS, 
and for uh, 800 the, the medium and high is going to be now a government uh, review, not self-attestation only. So um, one of the things uh, that we do at Complex and at Complex Government Solutions, uh, which is the piece of the business that I run, is um, you know, we're, a, we're a data analytics company that does uh, extremely sophisticated work um, using a number of, uh, of um, a, a number of pieces of um, uh, of our um, uh, IP related to data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. And we have a uh, we have a roadmap. We have a series of things that we do using this data analytics capability uh, to um, to address a number of compliance uh, requirements that um, that companies have. Um, CMMC is just one of those. Um, uh, NIST 871 is another one of those. NIST CF CSF, or for Common Security uh, uh, Framework, uh, is another one. Um, so our CMMC solution is just one of a, of a continuing piece of uh, compliance um, um, capabilities um, and assessments uh, that we're going to uh, that we're going to give you. Um, we have I mentioned before that when you um, you know when a, when a company purchases our solution, they have a, a license to use it for a year. Um, as part of that, any improvements that come out during that year, uh, the company um, uh, has access to. So as we release these upgrades and improvements, if you still have a valid uh, subscription, um, then you have access to it. Um, so what are some of the things coming on the roadmap? Well, one of the things that was already on our roadmap um, is our current solution is an intelligent workflow. Um, it's, it's been listed, you know, it's been called, um, you know, sort of like online tax software. Um, that's probably the best analogy. People often use a specific name for it that's copyrighted that I will not be using, right? But it's, it's like commonly found online tax software where they ask you some very specific questions in ways that make it easy to understand and you provide inputs um, that gives you a sophisticated output and it organizes it in the right way. Um, we it's are so tur turbocharge your ability to respond to those questions. <laughs> okay, so, um, the, <laughs> And in addition to that, uh, we have something, we have a, um, we have a, uh, a, a solution called uh, QScan. Um, and essentially it scans all the open source intelligence that's available on your company, which you've identified when you signed up. And we look for things um, that are troubling that we can find by uh, looking at open source uh, uh, bits of information. We, f we found companies that were, uh, that didn't know they were, uh, you know, phoning home to known ransomware sites uh, and various other things, um, and that's useful. It tells you a lot about cyber hygiene uh, of the company. But um, one of the things that we're doing is we're using some of our analytics capabilities um, in our roadmap to actually assess the strength of your answer to the cybersecurity control question. That one is uh, coming out uh, in the near term. Uh, right now, you're answering the question and you're seeing uh, our advice um, on, uh, on what it takes to answer the question, and you're seeing our score on your basic cyber hygiene. Um, and now, uh, and very soon, we're gonna be telling you, uh, using our analytics capability, to, tell, to give you some scoring uh, of how strong your answer is, right? The government doesn't care uh, about this uh, varying scale of your response, right? Um, there is no try, there's only do, right? So when they audit you, you've either done it or you haven't done it related to the support question. But the question we all have as we're getting ready is, is it good enough? Is what we've done good enough so the government's gonna say yes versus no on that uh, control question? And that's what we're really getting at. Now the interesting thing about that is, now that there is this other requirement, not replacing CMMC, um, but, uh, but in tandem with CMMC, uh, for the NIST 871, uh, you know, low, medium, or high um, attestation, um, we will be able to produce a module that will prepare you to answer that. 
Um, and that's, um, we're working on that in our roadmap right now. Um, we're accelerating that. So hey, Bill, can, I, can I interrupt and just add something right there? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the things that we saw that was unique about CMMC, uh, and, and you could say NIST 800-171 as it, as it matures, uh, it's not a one and done type thing. Uh, what we saw was this is a continuous process. That's, that's different for all of us within this community where it's certify, move on, right? Not only that, 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 you know, when you read the interim rule, you can certify different parts of your business at different levels, depending on, on what they need. That, that informed us together as we, as we formed the solution to say, we have to continue to develop here. We have to continue to refine the analytics, you know, from a Dun & Bradstreet perspective, what additional data is going to come in and make this, uh, make the tool better as, as we continue, as, as it's used, as the government continues to sort of raise the, uh, the bar on the requirement and as we get feedback. Um, you know, so the development for this is going to be an ongoing process for us just because the usage of it for you all is going to be an ongoing process as well. Yeah, that's a good point, Tim. Okay, and so for everybody, uh, Complex has put a, together a nice little YouTube video. We're going to go ahead and post the link there in the comments. Uh, but let's keep going with some questions here. Uh, we still got a few more to get to. Um, one of the so things while, while you're doing that, let me just say, um, if you watch that video, it answers a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. It's a short promo video. It walks you through it. It tells you what we do. It shows you some, you know, it shows you some pictures. Um, so I recommend watching that if you still have questions. Um, yeah, sorry, Brian. No, oh, you're good. You're good. But uh, actually, this one's for you, Bill. Uh, any idea how the government will, you know, quote unquote, uh, uh, prioritize audits as far as who gets audited first? Yeah, I wanted to answer that question to say we don't know. Okay, let me say that very clearly. So um, uh, that's a great question to ask uh, the government. There are a number of forums, you know, that um, OSD and Katie Arrington in particular do. Um, uh, that may even uh, that may even apply to some of the comments you're going to make on the uh, interim rule, um, uh, but that's not something that we can help you with. What we can do is we can help you start. We can help you get ready now. We can help you start getting ready now, and so as they sort that out, um, uh, you'll be ready when called. Right. So, um, but I wanted to clearly say we don't have any insight on how they're going to prioritize who gets audited first. Okay. Um, and, and then Bill, there's another one here that uh, somebody was saying they were in a, uh, Joseph was asking, he was in a conference, I guess uh, Katie Arrington stated that CMMC level three uh, and NIST SP 800, 171 are one and the same. Is this what you're hearing or are they truly different? Well, um, she's made it very clear multiple times that CMMC was largely built on NIST 800, 171. Um, and, and, but they've added some things. They've also looked at ISO 27001. They've also added some things, particularly for level four and five, but I think they're, you know, I'll have to double check on whether there's any level three that are unique only to CMMC. Okay. So when she says it's basically the same, um, she's saying basically, right? Not completely in, in its entirety. Um, what she's what she's saying is, um, and I have discussed this with her um, several months ago, was that um, uh, the phrase she used is, we didn't just pull these out of thin air, right? We took standards that you were already familiar with that we thought were important. And certainly NIST 871 uh, seems to be, uh, you know, the backbone uh, of CMMC, but it's not everything. And so... Um, you definitely, as you go through the control questions in the pre-assessment, you're going to recognize a lot of them. Um, but there's going to be um, a few that I think you won't yeah. um, or that you might not. And so I still recommend, you know, I still recommend it. And, and, and I would not be surprised if we saw continued changes uh, from the government on these as the threat vector changes, right? Uh, yeah, I, think, you know, I think they're going to be agile in the way that they respond to this. Yeah, very agile. And, and you know, you know, like, you know, like Bill said, the work that they're doing for the government and, and it kind of informs them a little bit as to how, why some of these requirements are coming to the forefront. You know, we do a, quite a bit of supply chain analysis, you know, a, a, across the DOD. And when you look at the, the complex relationships 
of supply chain all the way back to source, um, you, you start to look at the magnitude of the issue that the, the DOD is facing and why it's going to be so critical for, uh, you know, for us to continue to push these requirements, for them to continue to push these requirements down uh, further, further in the supply chain, right? So we got to make sure our own house is in order and our IT systems and how they, you know, whether those have to be independent of what we do inside our commercial companies. Uh, and then we have to be really intentional about what makes up the supply chain, whether that's material, whether that's data, whether that's code, uh, or, you know, or, or components that will ultimately wind up in the hands of the warfighter and the defense industrial base. So look, we have, um, we have uh, just about five more minutes left here. Uh, I want to make sure that we get to critical questions. We're, we're seeing them as they're popping up. We're getting a lot. Um, we also know that the, 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 a lot of these. A lot of very uh, good questions. Yeah, very good questions. And a lot of them are really around timing and sources of information. Uh, we want to make sure that we get that to you. We also got the message that the, the, the YouTube video link didn't work. Um, we're we're going to jump. That's just been corrected and put back out. Um, but we want to make sure that um, we want to make sure that we, we get to those to those main, the main questions. And the follow-up on this, we'll post, you know, the exact OSD websites, places to go, post your commentary. Uh, I put a link up there around this interim rule that provides um, a, a lot of that information. You know, please go take a look at it. Uh, but we also want to hear how we collectively can support you, because ultimately that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to support you through this requirement, both with information as well as, um, as well as the solutions that, that can facilitate this uh, while we're all learning in this process. So, so with that, I think we can probably take, uh, what, Brian, maybe one or two more questions? Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, somebody had asked again if the video is going to be uh, able to be rewatched. Yes. Uh, so we're going to send up a follow-up email to everybody that registered and attended. Not only will we have the link to the video, we'll include the links that Tim's been talking about to the video. Uh, to the to the readout on the interim rule and some of the other sources as far as where you can see the find the requirements etc. Um, and Brian, we made sure that that video is not behind any sort of paywall. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you can you can probably even just search for it and and find it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Bill. The, the other thing the other thing I'll say there too is you know Bill and I are both on LinkedIn. Go hit us up on LinkedIn with questions as well. Why? I don't know why it makes me feel good when I, my views go up. It's you know it's how it's. Part of my insecurity right but whatever that's a good place to hit us with questions and um as we were preparing to you know as this was coming out and you know it was obvious that hey we got two brothers that are doing this thing from different companies and i was getting a lot of feedback and and, and we're all you know he and i will jump in together and, and try to answer your questions too that's a it's just a great way to you know to hit us with some additional stuff or tell us what you want from us as far as the solution goes um uh, yeah Bill, I think there's a, there's a question from Mike uh, as well about the three principles not being informed about the level. You want to you want to answer that question then? Yeah. So um, so one thing I would point out is um, uh, you know their uh, their project um, uh, that Mike asked about relates to something that tends to be fairly sensitive in terms of DoD production. You know submarines. So there's a lot of classified stuff there. CMMC is designed to uh, keep your house in order related to uh, class uh, controlled unclassified information. There are a lot more stringent uh, requirements that are already in place uh, for classified stuff. But if you're unsure about, um, if you think you have a a, a, a renewal contract renewal coming up or a contract you're coming um, that you're going to be bidding on, we can't answer uh, if CMMC is going to be required for that or what level. The best thing you can do is is call the KO or call the, um, you know, depending on what re relationships uh, you have with the, uh, uh, with the PMs uh, or not to, uh, to figure out which direction they're headed. Um, I was going to say, ping your contracting authority as soon yeah. as possible about, about what those renewals are going to look like and what requirements are coming down. Because they're, they're, yeah. they're wrapping their arms around this the same time you all are. Yeah, in that case, uh, uh, you, you got to use the traditional um, uh, means of communication that you've always been using. Uh, when you're trying to figure out what's going on for uh, contract renewals, et cetera. Okay, uh, yeah, we got a couple minutes here. Any last thoughts you guys would want to share with the with the uh, group, Tim? Yeah. So, uh, as in all things government, right? Um, 
this is complicated and, and, and can be very tough for those of us who are sitting down there running businesses to try to explain to our companies uh, while it's important. What I will tell you is um, the, the, the threat has been a forcing function for these requirements to be put upon us and, and they are upon us, right? Um, there, is no, there is no opportunity to sort of sidestep this from a regulatory compliance perspective. Uh, get help and, 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 be, and be careful about um, the resources you have to commit to get yourself ready. Um, you know, as, you know, as Bill and I, we, we talk about this almost every day, you know, one of the things we said, it's like, hey, you know, I'm gonna go get my car inspected and they're gonna tell me what things I need to fix, right? That's, the, that's sort of the approach that we're taking here. Um, what we were able to do through the, uh, the value of the relationship was bring a tremendous depth of knowledge, experience and examples together uh, to make this as easy as it possibly can be for you all and to reduce some of that complexity and at least um, shorten the amount of time that it would take you to get to that, you know, to get to that first round of, of assessment. Yeah. Great. And Bill, how about you? Well, um, I, I would echo what Tim just said, um, that there is some complexity here, but there's a couple key takeaways, I think that we can uh, try to add some clarity to. From reading the interim rule itself, the government is clearly uh, uh, is not backing off of CMMC, um, and they're also talking about how they're doing the low, mean, medium, and high of the NIST uh, 800 So I also, um, you know, so we recommend that any company um, take, uh, use this um, pre-assessment tool that we've come up with uh, that's uh, fairly simple, uh, very well organized, uh, and fairly inexpensive um, in, in uh, you know, in the context of what it takes to get um, certifications done for, uh, for a, a DOD contract or, you know, for the cost of the contract. We tried to make this as, as uh, easy and as cheap as possible so people could use it um, wildly, uh, widely. Um, so, um, and also uh, remember that you can use it for a year. We've got some upgrades coming that we think are going to uh, increase the, uh, uh, the value to the customer even more. Um, so I encourage you guys to take a look at uh, the good link for uh, the promo video um, to uh, ask us if you have any questions. Um, and uh, this is not our last word on the topic. I'm sure Tim and I will be coming to you guys again, just based on all the questions we had that we weren't able to get to. Uh, there's probably some demand for some, some further uh, information from us. So I'm looking forward to speaking to you again. As Tim said, don't hesitate to reach out to us um, if you've got questions that can't wait. Great. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you all for attending. Again, if you have any other questions or would like a, a, an outreach from somebody from either of the companies, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A box or the chat and we'll be sure to get with you. And like I said, follow up email with the links to the different resources we talked about and a replay uh, of the webinar today. Uh, you'll also be seeing an invite from us for another webinar that we'll be hosting next week. Again, thank you and have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thanks.